Welcome to another message from Columbus First Assembly. Thanks for listening as we strive to learn and live the Word and ways of God. Our hope is that you're encouraged by today's message. Well, it's time for me to share some things that I have on my heart this morning. I'm going to start by talking about my story. Some of you know parts of it. Some of you who are new don't know any of it. So here we go. I was raised Roman Catholic. I went to Catholic schools from first grade all the way through high school. I have 12 years of Catholic education and one year even in a Catholic college. I had nuns, brothers, and an occasional priest as teachers, as well as many lay people. As a Catholic, I was instructed in our education in one area that they made sure that Catholic boys and girls received instruction was about hell. We learned about hell, and as a boy, I was taught about hell, and to be honest, I was afraid about going there. I mean, Catholic nuns have a very good way of teaching children about some of the things of the church and of the Bible, but at least where I went to school, and please, this is my story. You may have grown up Catholic or you may know people who are Catholic. This isn't their story. This is my story. But the nuns did a good job of helping me to understand the concept of hell, and I understood the concept of hell. If you weren't right with God, you went there, and it wasn't a place that you wanted to go. I had a I had a, a, a friend or an acquaintance, I don't know who told me this, but he also went to, to Catholic school and he said, we had one nun, we had one nun that talked about hell as if she's been there. <laughs> so I was afraid, even as a child, of going to hell. And see, as a Catholic, you're never really sure that you're right with God. You're never really sure if for some reason I would have a heart attack and I'm a Roman Catholic, I'd have a heart attack whether when I got there I would go to heaven or hell. Did I die with sin on my heart? The only time you could really kind of be sure is if you had just gone to confession. Confession is a sacrament in the Catholic Church where you go and you confess your sins to a priest. And a priest gives you some type of a a penance to do, usually prayers to pray. And then he does the sign of the cross behind that little screen and absolves you of all of your sins. And you can walk out of the confessional knowing at that moment that you're right with God. And that if on your way home you were to be in an accident, you would probably end up in heaven. But what about between confessions? I used to think about that thought about a lot of stuff as a boy. I don't know if all all Catholic boys do this, but I thought about that. What about in between confessions? What am I going to do? And honestly, folks, I wasn't a bad kid, nor was I a bad teenager in comparison to some of the others I went to school with. And my teachers, the nuns, the lay teachers, the priests, they made sure that uh, I I was taught about sin. And sin wasn't just what you did. They made sure that we understood that it could be in your thoughts. Could be in your words. Of course, it could be in your deeds. And the deeds, I stayed away from a lot of those. The words, well, I was known to have a temper and to say some things. But it was the thought stuff that was a real problem for me. And that's why I say in comparison, see, a lot of my friends, their thoughts became their deeds. So I could, well, you know, (laughs) but it was going on up here. Especially when I got to the middle school, junior high age and high school age, there there was a lot going on up there. And again, the Catholic instruction that I had received made sure that I understood the meaning of Jesus' words on the Sermon on the Mount. Some of you are familiar with these words where Jesus says, Now you know in the Ten Commandments it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. He says, But I tell you, if a man 
lusts for a woman in his heart, he's already committed adultery with her. And I heard that, and I thought, oh, crap. I'm an adulterer. Because I lusted after a lot of things in my heart. (laughs) I remember the first time that I ever confessed being an adulterer to a priest in confession. I had to have been maybe the seventh or the eighth grade. I understood the concept that was, was taught. And so... I went into the confessional. This was the old confessionals where there was a screen. Sometimes now they confess face to face. They've got so so I I went in there and and you know there's there's two sides to a confessional. The priest is in the middle, and so he might be hearing this person's confession over here, and everybody's talking in whispered tones, so you you really don't hear what's going on. So you're waiting for him to slide that little thing that's keeping him. And then he's gonna slide the one over there. And he slid the thing and you you kneel in a confessional. And you have to understand, I'm 13, 14 years old. Yes, me, Father. You know, my voice has sort of changed, but it hasn't. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was, I don't know, I made some number up four, four months ago, and these are my sins. And, and I, went through the, I went through the normal list, you know, the, the, the easier one. I've lied probably 50 times. I've done this. And then I said, and I've committed adultery like 14 times. I I, I couldn't see or hear what was going on on the other side of the screen. I am scared spitless. I have never confessed being an adulterer in my life. And here I am at 13, 14 years old. My heart is doing this. And and the priest goes, what, what, what? what?" (laughs) Because, Because here's this, he could tell it's a child. He said, you did what? Now I have to tell him again. I committed adultery like 14 times. He said, are you married? (laughs) And I said, no. He said, well, I don't think you could technically commit adultery. Oh, really? Well, what about? And anyhow, he asked me to explain. So I explained to him. And he was gracious and loving, and he gave me five Our Fathers and five Hail Marys and probably five Rosaries because I committed adultery 14 times. Um, he was gracious, and he absolved me of all of my sins. And I walked out of the confessional that day feeling a whole lot lighter because my sins were forgiven. I didn't take long before the thoughts were back on. Here's the thing. As a, as a Catholic child, as a Catholic teenager, and even as an adult in the Catholic Church, I never had any assurance that my relationship was right with God until something happened. I'm going to go back a little bit to around eighth grade again. One day in our class, One of the sisters came and we had a, let's call it a guest speaker. It was a guest nun. And she came in and she brought some things with her. They were called scapulars. And actually I have a picture of them. They're still available uh, to the Catholics. They're a couple of pieces of wool cloth. They've got string in between them. You would wear them over your neck and one of the pieces of wool would be here and one would be there. You would wear them under your clothes. Now, back in the 1200s, 1251 to be exact, supposedly the Virgin Mary appeared to a man on Mount Carmel and gave this man this promise about something that is called the scapular. Whoever dies clothed in this scapular will not suffer eternal fire. And this nun, this guest nun, had scapulars with him and began to explain to us students 
how if we will wear the scapular under our clothing, and she said it's probably not going to be real comfortable, it's wool, it's going to be itchy. But if we were to wear the scapular and we were to die while wearing it, we don't ever have to worry about going to hell. We would never suffer eternal fire. That was the promise. I tell you what, that presentation, I was riveted. Because you have to remember, I am a young man who is concerned about going to hell because I know that my thoughts are not where they're supposed to be. My, some of my actions aren't where they're supposed to be. I would just rally on my sisters. I would say things I shouldn't. My mom and I would fight and I would say things. I knew that I was a sinner and I never knew if I was right with God. But now I had the ability to know that I'd never go to hell. I didn't want to seem too excited amongst all the other 8th graders. I mean, 8th graders, you know, what 8th graders are like. I took that scapular home that night, put it on, put my pajamas or whatever on on top of it, and I wore that baby. And something inside, I, I just felt better because... I had this promise, whoever dies clothed in this scapular shall not suffer eternal flame. So I knew if I went to bed that night and I died, whew, I was safe because Mary said so. Now, it was back in 1251, but still Mary said so. Well, there's a problem with wearing this thing. You can't swim in it. You can't shower in it. You can't play shirts and skins dodgeball or basketball in PE class with this thing. And now I've got a problem. Because what if I get hit in the head while playing dodgeball and die? And I could get hit in the head playing dodgeball. We played hard and I wasn't good. And so... <laughs> and you can slip in the shower... So now I could only be comfortable when I had clothes on. So what am I going to do? Oh. Oh. I found out there was something called a scapular metal. Not wool. Not something that couldn't go in water. It was made of metal. And it had the same promise on it. Whoever dies clothed in this scapular shall not suffer eternal fire. And so I went and I bought one of those babies and I hung it around my neck. And I wore that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can swim in that. You can play shirts and skins dodgeball in that. I showered in it in PE. 30 other boys... I'm going to wear that, baby. You could slip in the shower. And they didn't think anything of it. They probably thought it was a gift from a girlfriend or something. I finally felt safe. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, wearing the scapular metal. Because a nun said that Mary said that I'd be safe. If I died, I went to heaven. And I met Jesus, he'd say, oh, oh, you're the one who, th mm, you thought, oh, you wore that. Come on in. That's what I was taught. But here's the sad thing, folks. That's false assurance. It's not real assurance. It was assurance in something false. And I didn't know that because I had been taught that it would be fine. I had put my trust in something that was false. And I would have been so disappointed if I would have died without having gotten true blessed assurance. See, false assurance is placing your trust in something that won't save you. And unfortunately, it's not just Catholics. The scapular probably doesn't have much emphasis in the Catholic Church any longer. I found out that one of the, papal, one of the popes back centuries ago declared that it wouldn't keep you from eternal fire, but the nuns never told me that. I just wore it every place. 
But there's other people walking around with false assurance that will appear before Jesus and have the surprise of their life. See, if, if as a 17, 18-year-old, I did, while wearing my scapular, pass away in a car accident or something else, it would not have saved me. Can you imagine the emotion? Can you imagine the emotion of this man at the age of 18 passing away with assurance based on something that is false and standing before Jesus and getting the disappointment of my life? You say, would that really happen? Actually, Jesus tells us it does happen. It will happen. Would you turn to a passage of Scripture this morning? It's Luke's Gospel, chapter 13. As a pastor, I read this passage, and I, I think of myself 30, 40 years ago, and how I would have ended up being one of these people had not I finally come to a relationship with Jesus. This is a very, very tough chapter. But it's Luke chapter 13. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation this morning. I hope you have your Bible with you or can get it on your device. I'm going to take some time to teach this passage a little bit, and then I'm going to draw this somewhat to a close. And you're going to say, when I draw this to a close, we didn't get very far. Well, I've already made the decision that we're going at least two weeks with this because the more I talked and the more I wrote, the more I realized I won't be able to finish it all. Luke chapter 13, Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he went, always pressing on towards Jerusalem. Now someone asked him a question. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? Now Jesus takes some time here, and he says this. He replied, look at the first two words, work hard. Work hard to enter the narrow door of God's kingdom, for many will try to enter but will fail. Now, here's the first thing I want to talk to you about just briefly as I teach this passage, and it's not in your notes, but if salvation is a gift and all we have to do is receive the gift, isn't salvation easy? Yes or no? If you're not sure, that's okay. Yes, it is easy. It is a free gift of God, freely given. Jesus has paid the price. Yet here in the passage, Jesus says, work hard. Why would someone have to work hard if it's easy to receive salvation. The reason is because of the amount of deception. It's easy to get saved, but there's so much deception as what is necessary. That you have to make sure that you have found what in another passage of Scripture is called the narrow path or the narrow door, for wide is the path and wide is the door that leads to destruction. There is a lot of deception out there in the world. And Jesus said, make sure that you work hard to enter the narrow door of God's kingdom, for many will try to enter but fail. When the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. When does the door get locked? A lot of explanation for this when the final judgment of the world. I don't believe that's what Jesus is getting at here. When is the door locked when you take your last breath? When you take your last breath, it's done. The Bible tells us that it is appointed, and I'm using an old translation here, it is appointed unto man to die once, take your last breath, last heartbeat, and then come the judgment. If you were in right relationship, if you truly had blessed assurance, you would go and be welcomed in. If not, the door is locked. We, um, work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom, for many will try to enter but will fail. When the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. Now listen, when you read this passage... And this is something, and I've, I've got so much underlined. I've been studying this passage for the past several years. It's been on my heart. I haven't really preached it in this way to you, but I felt that now was the time. It doesn't say they. The word that is used consistently through the passage is you. 
Why? Oh, you. Jesus is talking to religious people. Jesus is talking to Jews. Jesus is talking to those who had had the law. He is warning religious people, make sure that they are on the right place or they may be locked out because you will stand outside knocking and pleading. Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, but we ate and drank with you. And you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I tell you, I don't know who you are or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. Then there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For you will see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you will be thrown out. And people will come from all over the world, from east to west, north and south, to take their places in the kingdom of God. And note this, some who seem least important now will be the greatest then, and some who are the greatest now will be the least important then. As a Catholic boy, growing up and learning about Jesus, learning the stories, hearing them, After I came to a relationship with Christ and I read passages like this, I could just imagine myself back as that boy saying very similar things. Well, Jesus, I was taught. I heard. I believed in you. I'm wearing your medal or the medal that your mom said. And he's going to say, I don't know you. I don't know you. Can you, can you imagine the emotion of a person like that? I would put myself in the shoes of a 17, 18, 19-year-old standing before Jesus. And the reason I use 17, 18, or 19 because at 20, something happened in my life. I would have been welcomed in. But as a 17, 18, 19-year-old, I would not have. I didn't find the narrow door. I put my assurance in something that was false. Now, I told you my story a little bit humorously, but it's a very serious story to me. Because I can put myself in this passage. And you might say, oh, wow, Pastor, those Catholics. Boy, those other people are going to be surprised when they get to heaven. Or when they get before Jesus, not necessarily in heaven, they won't make it that far. They'll be surprised on their day of death judgment. (laughs) Boy, those Catholics. Listen. Listen. It's not just the Catholics. Well, yeah, probably those Lutherans. No, it's not just the Catholics or the Lutherans. Well, Well, maybe some Presbyterians, right? Listen. It's Assembly of God folks. It's Baptist folks. It's non denominational folks. It's folks across the board who if they don't have blessed assurance are very probably hanging on to something that is false assurance. What do you mean false assurance? Listen, I've been around people who tell me that they have a relationship with God or that they love God, but there's no evidence of it. So here's the question that we're going to ask this week and we're going to ask next week and possibly a week after. I don't know how long this is going to go. Here's the question in your notes. There's blessed assurance and false assurance. Which one do I have? I want you to write in first person. Which one do you have? There's blessed assurance and there's false assurance. Which one do I have? See, I lived in false assurance for a long time. I've known people who live in false assurance. There may be folks in this church that are living in some false assurance. What would that be? How could an Assemblies of God person have false assurance? We'll talk about that. Probably not this week. But here's the thing. There's some people who have no assurance. Well, that's a good place to start. I would prefer you to have no assurance than false assurance. Because if you have no assurance, you're going to want to know, are you right with God? And how can I get right with God? But if you have false assurance based on, I'll throw a few out there. Oh, I'm spiritual. I'm a good person. Well, I, uh, I said a prayer. Do you know that those things can lead you to a place of false assurance? As your pastor, I never want that. 
blessed assurance and false assurance. Which one do I have? A few years after telling the story about the scapular and the scapular metal and all of those things, because I was hungry for God, God helped me to meet some people that knew him that were also Catholic people. You know, I was a born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking Catholic for a couple of years before I felt I needed to move to a, a full gospel church. And they explained that it wasn't my good works, because in the Catholic, if you do enough good, hopefully it'll keep you out of hell. Or if you wear a medal, or some people believe that they wear a crucifix around their neck, that God will see that and accept them. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what we talked about last week. Understanding and accepting the fact that Jesus Christ paid for your sin with his blood and is offering a gift. A gift of eternal life and salvation and the forgiveness of sins, and it's available to all. The small group of people began to explain that to me, and at first I rejected it, because as a Catholic, well, that kind of goes against what it was, but I saw something in them, and the longer I was around them, the more I wanted it. So one day, one day, not in a prayer group, not in church. One day in the family room of my parents' house, sitting in an old wicker rocker, I said, God, these people, and I actually said the names because they were friends, told me that I need a relationship with you and that all I have to do is receive this free gift and ask, would you please forgive me of my sins and come to live in my heart? And he did. Something changed inside of me. Even when I wore the scapular medal, there were times that I wondered if that was really true. But when Jesus came to live inside of me, something radically changed. I knew it. As I continued to live it out over the next several months and years and now decades, I no longer have false assurance. I no longer have no assurance. I have blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation. I've been purchased of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. See, after those two years when I was born again, tongue-talking, spirit-filled Catholic, began to realize that I just couldn't remain in the Catholic Church because there was a lot of theology that wasn't right. And so I sought another place. I sought somewhere else. I had some friends that were born again, and they say, hey, why don't you come to our church? It's a Baptist church. I've never been to a Baptist church in my life that I remember. I didn't know what Baptists did, but I went. I joined that church, and it was a spirit-filled Baptist church. That's an odd one if, you're, if you came from a Baptist background, but it was. I don't know when the first time I ever heard that song. I don't know if it even began to mean as much to me the first time I sang that song. But when I understood the words, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. It got deep inside. I requested that the team sing the song this week. But it doesn't matter who's singing it. If it's our team, if it's on the radio, I, my heart is moved. Because see, folks, I grew up, first of all, with no assurance. And then I was given false assurance. I was probably in better shape with the no assurance, but that false assurance, man, I wore the medal. But then I found blessed assurance. I have just told you my story this morning. And I'm not giving you a lot of teaching, but the question is still there. Is blessed assurance and false assurance, which one do you have? If you are a born-again follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have received the free gift, you have blessed assurance. But if you're trying to get to God in any other way, you're trying to be good enough to get to God or you, you believe that there are multiple ways to God and Jesus is just one good way and you're kind of a little bit spiritually confused, may I appeal to you this morning 
you are, might be living with false assurance. And those who end up before Jesus with false assurance are going to find the door to heaven locked. I don't want that for anyone. Oh, there's so much more I'd like to say. Um, I've gotten through about four pages of my notes. And there were 11 this week and there's 11 next week. So there's a whole lot more that I want to say. But that's all I'm going to say today. But the Spirit knows. And I believe some of you might know. Or he can reveal to you. Have you truly been born again? Is it showing up in your life? See, after I was born again, my life changed. I knew it changed. My family knew that I was acting different. They just thought I was on maybe a, I don't know, uh, one of his things. I, as, as a young man, older teen, I went through a lot of things, okay? I got into a religion thing now. But after several months, they realized that, no, it wasn't just a thing. It was real in this boy's life. They began to wonder what happened. Because, see, when I got truly born again, saved, transformed, whatever word you want to use, I didn't know most of those words then. I just knew I wanted Jesus, and I wanted assurance that I wasn't going to hell. And I got it that day in my parents' family room. And you can have it today if you don't. And if you do have it, then I hope that you rejoice in the fact that you have assurance of eternal life in heaven with God. The team would make their way to the platform. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and to wrestle a little bit with this question. And we're going to wrestle with this question again next week. And I'll talk about some specific things. Holy Spirit, I know there wasn't enough time to get very practical. But Lord, you know the heart of everyone that's here. You know the one who maybe has an experience of many years ago where they felt your spirit and they prayed a prayer, but it's, never, it's not being evidenced in their life. Or maybe there's someone here that has no assurance because they have not yet received the free gift. Lord, you know every heart, you know every life. But Lord, your grace is here for us this morning. I pray, Lord God, that if there's someone who walked in today with no assurance, that if they met Jesus They would be entered, they would be welcomed in. If they have no assurance, that work on their heart today, Lord God, that before this time is over with, they will pray with someone and receive the free gift of the forgiveness of sin and eternal life. They would make Jesus their boss, their savior, their Lord. Lord, for someone who may be hanging on to some assurance based on the fact that they're, they're spiritual and, and they, they have warm feelings when they're in the presence of God. But, but honestly, they have not received the free gift. They're not truly born again. And Lord, this morning, I pray that you would, you would somehow stir their heart, help them to know that they're standing on something that is sand. And then for the majority of us, I believe, this morning who have a relationship with Jesus, may we rejoice in the assurance, the blessed assurance. In the name of Jesus, I pray. You've been listening to a message from Columbus First Assembly. We hope that you've been encouraged in your spiritual journey. If you're not part of a local church and would like to attend one of our regular services, our church is located at the corner of 10th and Iowa Street in Columbus, Indiana. Our Sunday morning worship services start at 10 a.m. and our Wednesday evening studies begin at 7 p.m. 
And while you're online, check out our website at columbusfirstassembly.org for details and information about our church. You will also find other messages and series that you can listen to or download. Thanks for spending some time with us and for taking advantage of this resource from Columbus First Assembly, where we strive to learn and live the word and ways of God.